In today's video, I'm gonna show you how I upgraded my shop storage for my detail sanding paper. And this is overall my way of making incredibly quick shop storage trays with dividers. You can do so much with these internally. And basically the process is for me to be able to get something built in about an hour, not including glue time overnight, but about an hour of work time to very quickly organize things. Now, all of these, you could go to much level, much higher levels of detail, care, precision, all of that. Now, specifically today, I'm going to be replacing these two. I do a lot of detail sanding and these hold little scraps of all of my grits. The problem is where I store these is really close to where I use my router and the dust and chips fly all over the place in there. And all the time, I'm having to take all the pieces out and vacuum them out. Okay, could move them, don't wanna move them. I know where they are, they're easy to access when I need them. So I'm going to rebuild these with little sliding lids that slide in and out, very quick and dirty. These are just some examples of other things I built uh, in just an hour or so. And of course, including not including glue time to dry overnight. And all we are going to use are these two backer board things I found off a dresser on the side of the road a while ago. This old piece of treated lumber and this scrap of pine. Um, we're not going to plane anything. The, everything is going to be incredibly rough and quick and dirty. And I don't want to use too many tools that people may not have. Uh, like I said, if you're looking for really beautiful high-end shop storage, this one isn't for you. All right, so let's quickly look at these and what we're going to do. Um, this is not going to have any hidden beautiful joinery. We're essentially going to be finger jointing these. We're going to be putting a bottom uh, groove in there and then we're going to be making divider slots. And as you can see, these are all visible. These are purely for shop storage. I don't care if someone sees them. And essentially the only thing we're going to change is we're going to add a groove to the top and then cut this down a little bit so that a lid can slide in and out. Okay, so I pretty much like the size of this um, and I'm going to just use this. We're going to resaw this on the table saw. I'm not going to bother to joint this at all. I'm not gonna plane it. We're just gonna go straight to the table saw um, as I know a lot of people just don't have a jointing jig or a planer. I'm going to resaw it straight down the middle if my blade can clear it. If not, I'm gonna rip this in half and then resaw it, I'll have to do a little bit of measuring. And then this will form the four sides of the box. This will get resawn into the lids, one half on each. And then these will form the bottoms. Pretty simple, I'm just gonna use the table saw. Any table saw blade you have will be fine. Um, and any power of table saw will be fine. This is just softwood and some cheap plywood. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to pick the rough middle of this board and we're just going to split the difference because each half will be used for each separate box. So they'll be the same size for the entire box regardless of whether these are identical, which they're almost certainly not going to be. I'm just going to line up that little line with the middle of the table saw blade. Now normally I'd use a feather board to help hold this up against here, but I know a lot of people don't have that, so I'm not going to use it. Uh, however, I am going to use a sacrificial fence uh, just to avoid hitting this. It's just a scrap piece of melamine. You can use whatever. These fence clamps are like 15 bucks on Amazon. And that just, just protects your fence from getting too close. Uh, to make this cut, for the majority of the early passes, I'm not gonna use any kind of holding tool. I'm gonna just use my hands up here to guide it as I think it gives it better control and the blade is buried inside of the wood anyway. So you're fairly safe. As we get towards the end, and definitely for the last cut, um, I'm gonna be using this. Well, actually any time that the blade starts to get above like here, I'm gonna move to using this to keep my hand away to keep that up against the fence. Now, there will be times when the pressure you're pushing in is over the blade, so you don't wanna ram it in there. You wanna use your top hand to still help hold it. And for the very last finishing cut, obviously as you go through, this is gonna fall apart into two pieces. If it makes you feel uh, safer, better, you can use this to finish the cut through. Sometimes uh, on a smaller piece, you absolutely have to. On these bigger ones, this blade is never gonna physically be able to get more than up here. Uh, so you may not need to, depending upon the size of wood you're using, but use as much safety uh, equipment as you wish. This produces an incredible amount of dust, so vacuum, dust mask, all necessary.
We've got our two halves now. These ended up actually pretty, pretty much exactly uh, identical in thickness, which is convenient for later. Um, I'm going to do the same thing with this. Uh, however you choose to make your lids, it can be plywood, uh, whatever, but I want to get rid of this old piece of treated lumber, so I'm going to do the same thing, resaw it. So we've got our pieces resawn in half here. I am going to probably have to hand plane these down a bit. I won't use the power planer because they're a little too thick for the amount of space I'll have. I am now just going to rip these both in half and then we'll cross cut to length and that'll all depend upon the size of your board, how big you wanna make your storage. We are now gonna do the finger joints first. And I have another video about making a finger joint jig, jig for your cross cut sled. So you'll see me using that. Um, if you wanna make your own, go ahead and watch that video and hopefully it'll help walk you through it. All I'm gonna do now is lay all these out and number them all so that when I'm going through everything, I remember exactly the order it's all in. And we will be cutting off the front lip of this after we finger joint them. Okay, the way I like to do this is I like to just make a shape, a different shape on each end. So we're gonna do circle square, triangle, or diamond, and then we'll come back and we'll do triangle. And again, because these are quick and dirty, I pencil marks all over it, that's fine with me. Now you're gonna need to decide now which side you want the top finger joint to go over. Um, on these, I guess I did it the long side, so we'll just do the same thing here. So I write over, and this will also signify the top. These will be labeled under so that I know for referencing on the box joint jig, this will be the top side and this will be the finger joint that goes under the other one. I highly recommend doing this. You can label them your own sort of way, but when you've got piles of these little things, uh, it really helps to have it all labeled so you look at a piece and you immediately go, oh, okay, I know which one this goes with, I know this one is an under, and I know this side is up. You can get lost very quickly if you don't do that. I would also suggest that if you have scraps left over from uh, ripping and cutting these, save too, so that when we set up the finger joints, uh, we have some of the same material to test. It's not necessary. You can use any scrap material to, uh, to test with to align the finger joint jig, but it's always nice to have the same exact material. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just set this up. Uh, if you're using your own finger joint jig, just do it as you normally would. If you're using the one I make, do it as I do there and just take my scrap material and raise the blade just a hair above and I'm going to use my spacer. It's got to match the blade if you're doing it with a non dado blade. It's got to match whatever blade you use. Now remember if you want them tighter you got to go that way. If you want them looser you got to shove it in more. Um, I like to just press firmly up against there and then just clamp down either side. But the reason we do a test is to make sure that we have it right. That should come out. All right, we'll do a quick test. Okay, we've got our test set up here. I'm really happy with these. It takes a little pressure to get them in, not going anywhere. Uh, I don't always get this on the first setup try, so that was really lucky there. I'm going to go ahead and just do the box joining for all of this finger jointing. Um, I don't think I need to show you a bunch of it. Okay, so we've got the first one done. I'm going to go ahead and do the second one, and then we're going to do the base groove, the top groove. And there are points along the way here where you can kind of play with things, like maybe you want to have uh, a dip here to make it easier to get your hand in, something like that. Um, I'm going to do dividers in this, a lot of them. You don't have to if you just want to make uh, small boxes. I also occasionally do boxes where the dividers are themselves their own thing. Uh, if you're using a really thin piece of wood and you can't put a bunch of slits through it, sometimes this is a good option as well. All right, now that we've got our boxes here, we're gonna do the base groove and the lid groove. And this is going to depend entirely in terms of marking this out, the thickness of your material. Now, because I'm doing these quick and dirty, I'm going to use the table saw. 
and essentially run these inside down across to create a group. Now I would like to note that if you are concerned with aesthetics, you will need to do this with a router, a chisel, a router plane, because when we run this groove through, it's going to come right out the end of this. And there will be a small little square hole opening on every side with that. I don't care, this is for functionality for me, but don't do this if you want these box joint exteriors to not have a little hole through them. Router, chisel router plane, the Dremel, uh, with the, the router attachment, something like that will help you there. All right, the simplest way to mark this out is to put it into a box form and then squish it open and pull it aside like this. Now we really only need to make four marks on a single piece here and everything will be referenced off of that. Now the first thing we need to do is pick a distance from either side that the lip will be. You don't want this too thin, but you don't wanna lose a ton of internal space. I think generally an eighth of an inch is enough. This isn't going to be carrying a ton of weight. If it is, you're going to want the bottom at a minimum to be probably 3 sixteenths, uh, but an eighth of an inch is usually a good standard for me. Now, I know that the blade I used was an, eight, an eighth of an inch. So I know at the top here, I'm going to just be going to the uh, first tooth mark here. So I'm actually gonna mark that on the other side so that I know we will be starting below this. Now my lid, I'm going to pick one. I'm gonna just call this A, and this will be lid A. These are not identical thickness, likely after hand planing, so I'm just gonna mark them each so I know which box goes with which. And we will then take this, and we're just gonna eyeball this for now as there. And now on the bottom, we know that again, an eighth of an inch, and when we're cutting, this will be relatively easy because we're gonna flip it. And take your bottom material, do the exact same thing. Again, we're just eyeballing it here. This is even easier if your lid and base material are identical. Uh, you will just be able to run it through both sides equally, and you'll be exactly there. Uh, now, one of the keys that we're gonna do here is that the initial cut is going to be the bottom and the top, uh, not the inside. We're going to work our way in to get the spacing right. It is helpful ahead of time to get this relatively close to final thickness because that will help us best determine the width of the gap. If you are going to like sand this thing, sand it to the second to last grit. Uh, don't go all the way yet, but second to last grit so you get an idea of how thin it's going to be towards the end. There's no need to cut this down to width or length yet. We're going to do that after the box is glued together. So leave this as is, but get it roughly to the final width uh, that you plan to sand if you do. I'm not going to sand it all here. We're gonna to head to the table saw now, and we're gonna bring with us uh, a piece of each of these for each box. All right, this is a real good time to make sure you're organized. You've got your box pieces separate, especially if your lids or bases are not all identical. We are going to put the table saw blade height relative to the thickness of our material. This is about 5 sixteenths, a little over of an inch. So I'm going to go about an eighth of an inch deep. I'm going to set this to about an eighth of an inch. You don't need to go super deep. Um, if this was a three quarters or larger uh, thickness box on the, the, the pieces of wood, a quarter inch is probably what I'd go to. But on these, we're only going to go to an eighth of an inch because the deeper we go, the weaker the little lip is going to be. This is going to be partially dependent upon the thickness of your material. On much thinner pieces, as little as a sixteenth or an over is fine. If you are using some kind of, um, I'll call it man-made material, something that's not going to change in its thickness and width, you can use a little glue to pin it in there so it won't move, meaning you can use a shallower uh, groove without any worries. Um, if you're using solid wood, you need to have a little bit deeper so that you can undersize your base a little bit so that it can expand. So that's all gonna come into consideration based on the thickness of this. But I'm gonna go an eighth of an inch. These are about 5 sixteenths or a little over. The way I like to set this up is that I like to do the cut on the outside and that way I can tap in as we go. I find it a little easier to nudge this inward than outward. So we're going to start with the outside of our saw blade on the furthest up point of our measurement. So about an eighth of an inch 
And so I'm essentially just going to be taking out this first tooth here. Fortunately, it all lines up with an eighth of an inch saw blade, but just make sure that of your two rows here, you're starting with the top on the outside, and then we're going to just be cutting a straight line down the inside of your top line where the lid would go. Once we go through for the lid, we can flip these around, and because we are doing the exact same distance from the bottom, we can run the bottom through. And we'll go through and do that with all of them, and we'll get that first initial line on the top and bottom cut. And then we will focus on the thinner of your two materials, the base or the lid. So let's get that first one cut. And now that we've got the initial grooves established, we're going to be moving this in so that we move in this way and in this way. Uh, if you do not have these clearly marked top and bottom and your materials are slightly different or majorly different thicknesses, take this time to mark the bottom or the top, whichever one is the thinner material. So that we start there, we're looking for the thickness of that one first. However, we are still going to be going through and flipping because there's no reason not to take more off of the top for our thicker material. But we are going to go until we get our thinnest material uh, to fit. And then we will stop there and make sure we have not gone too far at all for our thicker and then try to figure out roughly how far we need to go with our thicker and then we'll scoot over and cut that. I'm gonna run it through once, check it, and if I need to tap a little over more, I'll do that. I don't like to make these super tight uh, when I'm using plywood as the base uh, because this stuff, when it gets thin, has a tendency to you know, bend and flex and there's a nice potato chip here. So it's not gonna wanna sit perfectly flat in all of them. It's gonna be a little potato chipped one way or the other. And if you make it perfectly tight when you're trying to put the box together, you're gonna have to manipulate this to get it in. So you know, a couple hairs over the thickness is perfect. You want it to be able to slide in there you really don't want to have to pound it in there or hit it in there at all. Okay, so we've now got the thinner of the two sides, whether that's the bottom or the top for you done. We're going to leave that. We'll now take our thicker material. And we're just going to kind of set it up against there into the lid and we're going to make a mark as to roughly how far we have to go. For so, me, so for me, that's about another 16th, which means I'm gonna go about 3.30 seconds more because I want a little bit of wiggle room. It may even be an eighth of an inch more, but probably not. Uh, 3.30 seconds to a 16th to give this some breathing room so that when you're sliding it in and out, you're not getting you know, caught up on anything. We don't want it super loose. We don't want it falling out, but we want it to be able to slide in and out very easily without any friction uh, giving us some trouble. So go through and remember you're only doing your thicker side now for me That's the top this whole process is set up so that we can do everything fast and efficiently Which is why we start with the thinner side But we do both cuts at the same time and then at the end only do we do the thicker side We don't want to have to keep moving this all over the place It's much simpler when we do it in an order that allows us to minimize the amount of cuts in time It's gonna again run it through once I like to check the back side, the side your lid is going to slide into, because many lids and pieces of wood have a tendency to cup. And the most important thing is that the back side can get that full piece in there. And if there is a cup, it's gonna be a little thicker, essentially here, not actually thicker wood, but thicker space you're going to need. So pay most attention to the back and where that's going to be sliding in to the back of your box. It's really crucial to get this right now or else we're going to have to do a lot of work later to make this backside thinner. It's just easier to do it now and then just a little finessing later if need be. So this is roughly the fit we're looking for. We want it to be able to slide in there and we want just a little bit of wiggle room to go up and down in case this is cupped at all. Uh, it's very important to not make this a perfect fit because this is going to be sliding in back into there. Go through now and do all of your top lid groove cuts and we'll get those out of the way. Okay, we're just gonna do one final test here. Yep, we're okay there. I think I overshot actually a little bit. It looks like I hand planed this one a little bit thinner, but that's okay. All right, we're now going to go 
and we're going to measure and cut the base. We will then be cutting off the top of the front side so that our lid can slide in and out. All right, so we're just gonna pre-cut the base now while this is still uh, just kind of in pieces and open before we cut the front lid group, before we cut the fingers, uh, et cetera. Now, the quickest way to get this measurement is to simply go from the inside of each of these fingers here and then add your depth of your cut times two, one on each side, because these will be closing in here and you will be left with the depth of this plus the depth of this and then the in-between space from where the fingers meet. There's no need to do a bunch of, you know, really precise measuring and then cut this a little bit of a hair under just to give yourself some wiggle room. I've got a, a real nice potato chip here, so I'm gonna need a little bit of wiggle room. Okay, now that you've got your base fitted in here, we can set that aside. That's all done for when we go to glue up. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pick a front and we're going to trim off just enough to allow us to get the lid to slide in and out without having a large gap below that. Now, on certain other boxes, I make a front lip. However, this is so thin and purely this is for storage that I'm not going to do that. We're going to end up putting a hole or some kind of shape in here to just easily slide the lid in and out instead of having a lip that we can pull. If you wanna do a lip, I've got a video on uh, the lids and the front lip for mitered boxes. You apply the same here, except with the router, instead of running it all through, you have to plunge on the router. Different, different topic, perhaps for a different video on how to do it with box joints. I'm going to look at this and see that my lid is going to come out right at the bottom of this finger here. So I'm going to shave off just down to this finger depth right there. And that will allow the lid to slide along here without a big gap between. Okay, so we're gonna raise the blade to go through this whole thing because we're making a rip cut basically here. And I'm going to align it such that the very bottom of this groove plus a hair is on the side of the, we're cutting that off. So uh, just a hair over the bottom of your groove, what finger that is. Now you can go further if you want. You obviously can't go less. So for me, just cutting it right off at the beginning of that finger. Okay, so when we go back to reassemble this, the front will slip on and we will be exactly below. Let me get closer here. Okay, and so this is where we will have the alignment. I hope you can see that. This has been shaved so it lines up right here. And then I'm going to trim out this middle little finger here. Um, I don't know, just because I'd like to remove that for looks wise, but uh, it doesn't really matter. You can shave off both of these, but the lid will slide out just fine as is if you want to leave it right here. Okay, so to cut this, normally I'd use a bandsaw, but I said I wasn't going to use that. So I'm going to go ahead with a chisel and I'm going to score it from this side as well so that we minimize tear out. So I'm gonna score along that line, but when I go down, I'm gonna go from the other side because if we were to chisel from this side, that thing would be just pounding. There's nothing under there and it would almost certainly cause tear out and rip out. I'm just gonna score that like that. And then I'm gonna flip it over and ideally just a quarter inch chisel, possibly even one below, we'll see. I'm not gonna lie, this is super awkward trying to lean over this. A little press down and boom there we go pops right out and if you want you can go back and uh, clean that up a little bit if need be but I'm gonna do that to this one and then the other two sides as well okay here comes a big choice for me I want to be able to put a bunch of dividers into here and I'm going to use the remaining leftovers of the bottoms to do that. Now I want a lot of flexibility. I'm not gonna cut these deep so I can get away with putting quite a few in, but we're essentially gonna do a cross cut across here to remove grooves matching on both sides that then the dividers can just slide into from the top. If you are worried about the visuals of the top showing the divider, you're gonna need a router and you're gonna have to go from this side or do it by hand, router, plane, chisel, etc. Uh, again, I don't care, so I'm going to go through the top, and I'm going to probably put these every 
half of an inch, I think. I'm only gonna be going about a 16th of an inch deep into this. So we won't have to worry about any kind of like kerf bending-esque action there. So I'm gonna put these probably a half inch, maybe five eighths. So I'm gonna mark all this out and then we'll go and we'll cut these on the table saw. One way to save yourself time if you don't wanna use a square and draw a bunch of lines across. When we're on the table saw cross cutting, we're gonna have this down and we're only gonna be seeing here. So you can just make little tick marks across this area at your measurements. You don't need to bother to go do a bunch of line drawing. Stick, the, stick a ruler on this and just start making your little marks. That's all you're gonna need. We'll then put an X in between the areas we wanna cut out, save a ton of time. When you're drawing out these marks, you're gonna wanna take the width of your divider material and then add just a hair. We want these to be able to go in and out easily, at least in my case, because I wanna be able to have a lot of flexibility. If you make it really tight, it's just gonna be annoying. So take the width of this plus a little bit, and always factor in for, if you're using very thin material, some potato chipping, some cupping, curving, et cetera. So that's why we leave a little bit of a hair in there. Um, just, it's much easier on yourself to leave a little room now. Don't leave too much though, because we're not going super deep and we don't want these to be able to, to twist this way and fall out. All right, I've got all my uh, spaces marked out. Now, because all of these are gonna be identical for me, I only have to do this once. If you're having different trays with different spacing, you're gonna have to do this for each different one. But we're just gonna put an X where we're gonna cut out so that when we get over there, we don't get confused. All right, let's head over to the table saw. Okay, I'm gonna use the miter gauge. You can use a cross cut sled or whatever. I'm also going to use a stop block so that every cut is exactly the same. Now, here is something you have to remember. You are having two opposing sides. So to get these two to line up, this one has to go in through the top and this one will then have to go in through the bottom. So for each opposite side, one will come from the top through and one will come from the bottom through. If you put these all top up and these are not perfectly measured out in space, they will not line up. So it's very important. What I like to do is label right and left. I guess, yeah, okay, right and left. And then on this one, because it's going to be the opposite side, I'm going to label right and left with the lettering facing the same way so that I always put them in the same way. It's really crucial to get this right or else your grooves are not gonna line up. So just put them next to each other and that way you know exactly which directions you're gonna be. Label them, flip them down, label them, you're good to go. Okay, I think the easiest way to go do this is to start with a pile, all of your rights facing to the right, of course, and the one with the markings on top. And we're gonna go through, you're gonna cut, cut and we're just going to stack them and then we'll go through the opposite way after we move this and like I said we're going to make the outside cut on all of them then we will scoot this over really quickly move this and just we're going to just go through and do them all like that. The nice part about doing it this way is if you are not exactly on your measurements they will all still match. You don't have to worry about them mismatching as long as your stop block doesn't move while you make each cut. Even if one's off by a 32nd or a 64th, they'll all be off by that, meaning that the sides will still match. All right, before I finish these, I just wanted to show you why we label them and we go through the same way. These are the opposite faces. They line up really nicely when they're together, perfect. Now, if I tried to go through the top on both of them, you can see that the opposite side would be a little further forward on each of these because this is not a perfect distance and my measuring isn't perfect, but that's why we go through the same side on all of them so that they all meet up really nicely. While I've stopped here, I wanna point something else out. Now, knowing the size of my saw blade is 1 8 of an inch, I can line that up. I'm a big fan of using shims. So if I see that, and I find an object that is the same distance over to the end of my line. We got, we're pretty close there. Let's try, got a business card here. Yeah, I think if I double fold that, I will be able to then make that cut. Here's the premise here. We make that cut, and when we come back, we've done all of those. We're gonna take our spacer, we're gonna put it in there, undo this, 
pop that out, slide it over, and that's exactly our measurement. And that's why I'm not having to stop the saw every time and line these up. And that will get me perfectly with that. So you're gonna have to make or find the spacer. Like I said, I keep a dollar bill around for very fine measurements. I keep this cardboard that's currently on the end of a razor around, but I have some other ones. All kinds of things can be used as shims. Uh, different thicknesses of tape, blue tape, packing tape, have different thousandths of an inch. So I really suggest if you wanna speed this up, finding or making a shim. Now, if you wanna get really fancy with shims and you wanna go fast, either cut a piece of wood to the spacing between each of these setup blocks, something like that, and you can just immediately stick them in, pull them out, and now you've got your next one. This will allow you, if you do not want to stop and line this up at all, to just rip through these. Um, I don't mind doing it by eye. I'm not that like concerned about the accuracy. But if you really want, use, uh, use some setup blocks to give yourself automatic spacing. Okay, now that we've got all our divider rows cut, and because we only went a sixteenth of an inch, this still has plenty of structural integrity. Just go ahead and do a dry fit of everything on your box. Um, just put it all together, take a look. Make sure these all line up. And then at this point, it will be a personal choice whether you want to do sanding and finishing. Generally, I don't do anything. I guess the only thing I do is really at the end, or you can do it now, is put a light um, bevel with just a block plane, just one swipe, uh, just to round over those edges, just a hair. But other than that, I usually don't even erase. I don't do any of that. These are purely for storage. So this is gonna be a point where you decide how far you wanna take these with things like sanding or hand planing. And at this point, this is what your box should look like. Once you're done with any sanding, whatever, you can go ahead and glue this up. And then after it's glued up, we'll come back and deal with sizing the lid and then sizing the dividers as well. Now I'm gonna glue this up before I head in for the night so that it's all ready the next morning to just do the lid and the dividers. And the quick kind of tip I have for gluing these up because I don't care a ton about uh, how they look is I like to put them so that the fingers are just barely touching on the inside. I've unfolded it. I'm going to flip it over this way and this will prevent a lot of squeeze out internally. I'm going to take a bead of glue and I'm gonna run it down. I'm gonna push it down with my finger. I'm gonna wait about 35, 40 seconds as that glue drips through a little bit. And then I'm gonna go ahead, flip it back over, put the base in, fold it up. Now, I personally don't use clamps or more than maybe one if these fit nicely. Uh, I find one of the problems with very thin boxes is that if you clamp them too hard, they will bow in the middle. It will like squeeze in. And then when you're going to cut your dividers, the ones here have to be thinner. It's an absolute nightmare. So if you are gonna use clamps, make sure they are on the very end. Do not put them in this area or you're going to squeeze that together. However, if your joints fit really tight, a little bit of clamping pressure to get it together, fine, whatever. Um, I'm not gonna clamp these. I just have never had the need for it when they're tight. One thing you're also gonna wanna make sure is that on your front, you don't put any glue across this area and try to avoid getting it into the groove on the lid side in the back. Though if we have to, we can go clean that up later with a chisel. We're gonna fold this beast up. All right, and there we go. And I'm just gonna let that sit overnight. Like I said, you can use clamps if you want. I'm not going to. If you are clamping it, also be careful to make sure that as you're squeezing them, this does not go out of alignment at all. Squeeze a little bit on each corner at a time. You'll be good to go. Now that these are glued up, we're gonna go on to making the lid. But before we do that, if you want, this would be a good time to start sanding this. Uh, if your finger joints are relatively proud, flush trim, or if they're not really proud enough for the flush trim to easily grab, you can use a chisel. Or I like to always have some different grits glued down to some MDF and you can just rub these back and forth and they'll disappear in a few minutes. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about the lid. We want this lid widthwise to have just a little play left and right, especially if you are like me making this in the winter. In the summer, it's going to get more humid in most places and this will expand just a little bit. If you make this a perfect fit, 
and there's any expansion, if it is not the most humid day of the year when you're making this, it will get stuck or at least tight. It could get really stuck if it gets very humid and you've made this in the winter. Now there's an easy way to get our rough starting width that doesn't involve sticking a ruler in there. We are essentially gonna take our lid and just slide it in here a little bit and then stick a pencil into the corner as far as you can into this gullet and just mark the edge and do that on both sides and that will get you your starting width. When you go to the table saw to try to rip this, don't try to do it in one go. Do your initial rips, do a test fit, and then shave a little bit off at a time. It's better to be a little slower, a few seconds slower, than to have it super floppy. You don't wanna end up in a situation where one day you go and you pick this thing up and it just flies out. Okay, this is what we're looking for. Easy slide out and just a little bit of wiggle room back and forth. That way it's not flopping out on us, but it's also not going to stick at all. We don't want a really tight fit. And once you've done this, go ahead and cross cut it. Now some people when they cross cut these like to go absolutely flush up to here and then put in a hole, which is what I'm going to do. Some people like to leave a little bit extra and just have that as a tab. You can do it however you want. Like I said, on this one, I'm not doing any kind of front lip. That's a different process. So I'm gonna just cut it flush and then I'm going to drill a hole in here as just a finger pull. Okay, we've got the lid all in there. If you line this up correctly, it'll sit relatively nicely down on, I hope you can see that, yep, down on the, the lip there, especially in my case, as I'm trying to avoid stuff getting in there. And then obviously I'm putting a hole in here because it's not the easiest to get out without something to grab on. In regards really quick to hole placement, I'm going to put mine the distance back from the edge, this will be the outer diameter. I'm gonna use about a half inch drill bit. I think that's the biggest I have. And the reason I'm setting it back that is so that I can just clear this so that when my finger goes in, I'm not hitting that below. Now, obviously this is a place where you could experiment. You could do some creative stuff. If you wanted to put some kind of pool on top here, maybe a funky shape. If you wanted to cut some kind of interesting hand finger hold out of here, you know, woodworking is a lot about creativity too. And even though this is a very simplistic, functional project, a lot of times these are the best places to experiment. You're not selling it. You're not trying to impress anyone. It's cheap wood. If you want to play around with some little pools, this is a perfect time to do it. Have fun. This is all about having fun at the end of the day, or for some of you, maybe perhaps making money. But having fun is still part of woodworking for all of us. Now that we've got both holes drilled, and this is a good size for me, not a lot's going to get in there. It's just big enough for my finger. Uh, I am going to round this over a little bit because there's obviously a little bit of a, a sharp edge there. I'm just going to take a sanding stick and go around from both sides. And that is nice and gentle. We will go into making the dividers and I am just using, again, this leftover. You're going to use whatever you use to size these. Now, this is a place where I want to talk about the clamping uh, pressure issues that I mentioned the other day. And if you have over clamped, this is a box I did a long time ago and I hope we can see this. You can see the gigantic gaping hole through there. That is what happens if you place your clamps too hard here, it will pull it in. And that's a problem because when you go to make these, you will not be able to cut them all the same size. You will have to do them individually, which then means if you wanna move any around, some of these in the center here are going to simply be smaller. It's going to be really problematic. So this is why I was saying, be very careful when you're clamping or else you will pinch this in and it's a total nightmare for dividers. Now, at this point, I'm going to assume you can make dividers, so I'm not going to show that, and we'll just wrap it up here in a second and call it a day. And there we have it. We have completed our shop storage trays. I'd say this was about an hour of actual working time. Uh, I had to shoot this over the course of a few days late at night, but in terms of actual time you'll spend for two of these of this size, it took me about an hour. You'll have to leave them in, you know, gluing up for at least an hour before you can get back to them. But we've got ourselves some nice, storage trays and for me gonna organize my sandpaper and I really just I love these things easy access all right thanks everybody uh, let me know if you have any comments criticisms let me know how I can improve these videos 
Uh, if you have any trouble with any parts of the steps, feel free to ask me. All right, have a good one.